Atheist Nomads episode 103, We Both Love Scissoring, with Callie Wright. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. As a concerned parent of the uh, free thought community, I want to advise uh, atheist nomad listeners that this is an adult show. There will be things discussed, talked about, topics that may be inappropriate for children under the age of 25, 40. 26, 27, yeah. 40. <laughs> We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode 103. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello. And joining us today is Callie Wright. Hello, hello. Callie is the host of the Gaytheist Manifesto podcast and uh, a uh, trans activist and a rising star in the atheist community. Callie, welcome to Atheist Nomads. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Great. Yeah, we've uh, we've been talking with you off and on just a little bit on this on the down low in our little private group for all the. Mm-hmm. The podcasters for a couple months now, and the, the secret yeah. shadow group. Bum bum bum. Nobody knows about this. <laughs> yeah, there is a cabal of podcasters. The, you're breaking the first rule right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fucking a Fight Club, but still, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're the the admins of the group, so we. Can, oh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> we make the rules. <laughs> okay, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Kelly. Uh, why don't you uh, start off telling us a bit about your yourself? Well, as you said, I host a show called The Gaytheist Manifesto. We talk about the intersection of atheist and LGBT activism and, um, you know, kind of where those two movements intersect, things that atheists and LGBT folks have in common, um, you uh, know, with the same identities. Enemies? <laughs> well, right. <laughs> the same enemies, sometimes the same identity struggles, um, you know, fundamentalist religious people that that is their identity. And, um, you know, when they realize it doesn't make sense anymore, there can be kind of an, an identity crisis involved. And, um, you know, sometimes the same consequences for coming out. I mean, I've heard some pretty awful things that people have done to their family just for saying, like, I don't believe in God anymore. And obviously, I've heard tons of awful stories about um, you know, people coming out as gay or trans or bi or, you know, any sort of flavor of, of queer or trans. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it just kind of made sense that there was, you know, there were, there were things to say at this, you know, at, at the intersection of those two movements and that, um, and, you know, that was kind of a niche that I didn't necessarily see being filled. So, um, you know, had the idea for the show. And so me personally, I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm a trans woman. Um, still kind of trying to figure out where I fit on the whole sexuality thing. But that's a long story. Um, but so I, you know, I came out, started transition just under two years ago. Uh, next month will be two, August 14th is my, my trans Um, nice. <laughs> so yeah. So, and you know, I just, I've always been kind of a person that like, I, I want to, you know, I want to help. I want to make a difference. I want to try and, you know, I like having conversations with people, so, you know, and, and actually, like, I kind of feel like an idiot that it took me this long to figure out that podcasting was a thing that, like, was a good fit for me. So, um, so, you know, when I, you know, when I came out, because, you know, when you're in a closet, you, you know, th- there are certain things like you don't ever want to do because if you do, then it becomes real. So I didn't really know a whole lot about what it was like for trans people who were out or for, even for gay people who were out. And, you know, the, the violence and the, you know, homelessness, lack of access to healthcare and all of these disadvantages that queer and trans people face. And, you know, once I learned more about that and started getting more involved in the community, it was like, I, I've got to, I've got to get involved. So, um, so, 
you know, I, I started, you know, being involved with some of the, the, you know, local organizations here that, that do queer and trans activism and the, you don't the mind. Thing, where is, where is here? Oh, I, I live in Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. And um, any groups you want to give a shout out to? Well, yeah, there's the, the human rights campaign, HRC, which, um, so few people know the name, but they're the little blue equality stickers that everybody oh. has on their cars. So that's, that's HRC, um, glisten, which is uh, G L S E N gay street, gay lesbian straight education network. Um, they're all about safe schools, anti-bullying stuff like that. Um, there's a local organization here called heartland trans wellness that does a lot of healthcare and education and advocacy for trans people. Um, so those are, those are kind of the three big ones. Um, and then I'm also on the planning committees for different, you know, various events that happen around here. So, um, very nice. What, what kind of jump started the whole thing was, um, I'm sure you guys remember when Leela Alcorn committed suicide, the, mm-hmm. the trans girl. So, um, that happened like 20 miles from my house. Um, since so she was from Cincinnati and, um, and, you know, so we had, we, you know, we had vigils for her and, you know, and, and, it, and it hit really close to home because she was part of our community. I mean, her parents didn't let her be active in the community. It wasn't like she was known, like, you know, in support groups and in the community. So we had, we had a vigil for Leela Alcorn when she died. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there are always affirming, open and affirming clergy at these events and, one of the the ministers that was there was talking and she said, I believe God was a first responder on the highway that day. And to refresh everyone's memory, how Leela Alcorn committed suicide was she stepped out in front of a truck on a highway. And when I heard that, I got very, very angry. And that was the first time that I ever actually, I had to just step away from something. Most of the time I can, shake my head, whatever, let it go. Um, but that was, that was kind of the, the impetus. Like I have to do something because, you know, I'm I'm not going to, I don't want religiosity infecting this community and giving people and having people have attitudes like that. So, um, you know, I wasn't sure exactly what to do. And then, um, you know, we did, uh, I, I used to volunteer. Well, I still kind of do for dogma debate doing audio production. And, mm-hmm. uh, we did the, uh, the 24 hour broadcast for foundation beyond belief, the fundraiser. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they did those three best of shows afterwards. I was the one that captured the audio for all of those. And so I just, I was like, I, I, I should do a podcast. Like, this is obvious. Why haven't I thought of this doing something like this before? Um, so, you know, I got my friend Jonathan and my friend, uh, Daniel to, uh, you know, to, to help me out. And, you know, we did, uh, we did a pilot episode and, um, you know, David Smalley liked it. And so, you know, here we are, Jonathan's no longer with us, unfortunately. So it's, it's Daniel and I, but, uh, but yeah, so here we are. And, you know, we talk to cool people about cool stuff. We try and tackle, you know, difficult topics and kind of shed some light on you know the queer community for atheist community people and the atheist community for queer community people so um kind of a education kind of outreach kind of thing so cool badass man so that just kind of like like dominoes just kind of fell right in right in on you well right because i i you know, I, I was thinking about this the other day. So the first real activist thing that I ever did was, um, I don't know if you guys know, there's, there's a day that the trans community observes called the Transgender Day of Remembrance. And um, it's usually, I think, the third Friday in November. Um, at least that's when we're doing ours this year. Um, but it's a day where we actually get together and commemorate members of the trans community that we've lost that year, um, mm-hmm. either through murder or suicide. I wrote this poem about a really bad day that I had. And, um, you know, these girls were staring and laughing at me in this gas station that I was in and I wrote a poem about it and I posted it on YouTube and someone who was on the planning committee for the trans day of remembrance reached out to me and asked me if I would be willing to speak there. So I did the keynote last year. And so, you know, last November was the first real sort of activisty thing that I ever did. So like, I'm still very, very new to this whole thing. Yeah. That's just a little Um, over a year after you came out. (laughs) Uh, exactly. And, um, only you know, a few and, months back. <laughs> well, right. And, 
So, you know, I mean, I, I kind of dove into this thing head first and, you know, in, so, you know, when, when I, when, you know, when I decided like, I, I've got to do something, you know, atheist community oriented, LGBT community oriented, um, you know, I was afraid I was going to have to fight to get people to have these conversations in the atheist community because everybody's awesome about talking about gay marriage and stuff like that. Like those conversations are super easy to have, but you start talking about really uncomfortable stuff like healthcare for trans people, um, you know, stuff that's not so pretty and doesn't, you know, look good on a campaign sign or, you know, on a protest sign or whatever. Um, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff. Like I thought I was really going to have to fight, to get people to have those conversations. And, and that, that, I mean, that hasn't been the case at all. Um, I've been really, really pleasantly surprised by how receptive people have been and how excited people are to have conversations about the real stuff of the, the substantive stuff, the stuff that actually is going to like really make people's lives better. So, um, so I, I've, I've got, you know, lots of people have, you know, criticisms of the atheist community, some more legit than others. But, you know, when it comes to this kind of thing, I'm, I've actually been very, very pleasantly surprised at how receptive people have been. Nice. I mean, you do kind of have a, have a double whammy there of uh, being a trans lady and an atheist in a, you know, in a mostly <laughs> Christian co- country. <laughs> right. So, yeah. <laughs> man, yeah, it, it definitely can't be easy. I mean, just the one or the other isn't easy on itself but uh fuck i i have a lot of gay friends out here who are in my atheist group and they're like you know it was actually easier coming out as gay than it was atheist you know i've heard that story i have i have one friend who you know grew up as the son of a southern baptist preacher and his entire family knows he's gay could not care less but Mm -hmm. they would disown him if he came out as atheist um, it, it, and I will say for me, you know, I personally have never really experienced any hardship at all because of being atheist. Like, nice. you know, the worst thing that I've had to deal with are like those, you know, silly looks and stupid questions that people get. Like, um, like <laughs> the dumbest thing anyone's ever said to me was somebody asked, like, so you're atheist, right? And I said, yeah. And they're like, so like full on all the way atheist. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> you so, know, it, it's not like you can say I'm a Jew, but you know, actually, I'm just Jewish. <laughs> you know? uh, right. I do have a friend that says that. <laughs> <laughs> her dad is Jewish, but her mom isn't, so she's not really a Jew. If you ask Jews, well, it goes gotcha. through the mom's side for that. Uh huh. So she says she's Jewish. <laughs> That's uh, I was great. Trying to channel a little bit of uh, Orange Is the New Black on that. <laughs> So, which yeah, Justin so, needs to watch. I have watched a few episodes. Oh, oh, sorry. I had a hard time getting into it. Oh. I am such a bad queer because I haven't seen any of the new third season and I've seen only like half the second season. I won't give spoilers, but there's a lot of um, backstory, a, a lot of uh, flashback videos, which is really great to learn about the characters. Yeah. And, and I actually, a friend of mine showed me one episode where I forget the character's name. The like super super butch big lady. Oh, uh, uh, um, um, boo. Yeah, yeah. Like the the episode where they go and show her backstory and like how her parents yeah. are super shitty to her because she won't wear girly clothes, stuff like that. That's I mean that that stuff kind of hit home for me. Like I mean I didn't have a childhood like that because obviously I didn't come out until I was twenty eight. But um, she she had the very fifties vibe parents that were also very religious and very. Man does work, woman does barefoot kitchen stuff. Right, exactly. And, you know, thankfully, I mean, I was lucky enough, you know, almost all of my family and literally all of my friends were very, very supportive of me when I came out. Um, You know, my relationship with my grandma is super tense to the point where, you know, I'm probably kind of done with her at this point, but... Um, you know, and my aunt just plain out refuses to talk about it. Like I've tried to have conversations with her about it and she won't even talk to me about it. And she won't call me Callie and she won't use she, her, her pronouns. And, um, so no. like, you know, I'm kind of, kind of done with her. But I mean, aside from that, you know, my mom, my brother, my sister, um, my one uncle, like I have a couple of other uncles that I don't 
really i never really had a relationship with anyways not because they're bad people or we don't get along it's just we weren't close and um you know one uncle who was really cool and you know all of my friends so i've been extremely privileged in how accepting you know my family and friends have been of me and supportive of me Um, i mean i definitely would not be able to do the things that i do if i didn't have that kind of support um because you know i mean even with all the support that i've had i mean i had lots and lots of really really tough stuff you know with you know, trying to figure out who i am and you know being scared to leave the house and um you know i mean i've i've developed some mild social anxiety and you know dealt with depression and that kind of stuff um so it's i mean it, it's still been really tough but honestly i've been super lucky because of how how awesome and supportive most of my most of my well most of my family and all of my friends have been awesome fuck yeah i mean Friends are the family that you get to pick, so fuck it. Yeah. Surround surround yourself with all the good ones. Well, yeah, and and you know, and the the thing that I love about my close friends is that they're they're the kind of friends who will be honest with you. You know, I you know, my two I mean my two best friends as far as like, you know, the people that I, you know, hang out with the most and stuff. Um, or guys and you know when I came out to them you know they I mean they had the same concerns a lot of people do like you know are you going to take hormones and turn into a completely different person like I don't want to lose my friend like I want you to be happy and I want you to do what you need to be happy but I don't want to lose my friend and you know and at that point I hadn't done enough research and I'm like honestly I don't know what's going to happen mm-hmm. um, and and I, I didn't really turn into a different person I mean I'm happier I'm more comfortable with myself so you know I, I'm I'm probably different in that way but, um, you know, it's just easier for me to be the person that I want to be. And um, you know, I, I feel feelings the way that I always thought that I should and stuff like that. So, you know, now that we're now that we're, you know, tears on the other side of it and it's not, uh, you know, it's not a new thing. It's not the unknown anymore. Um, you know, it's it's kind of hard to believe that things were ever different. You know, everybody's just I'm just Cali to everyone. And that's who I am. And that's all that's all it is. So it's that's kind of cool. Fucking refreshing. <laughs> Just nice to be able to just fucking let your just let a breath out and just like sit and you know, just find some peace. It it really 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 is, and I mean peace is definitely the word for it. Um, you know because there were times like you know growing up like you know I was in bands and you know we toured and I was always thinking about like the next show, writing the next EP or album, and you know record labels and all that sort of stuff, and so like. I, you know, it was kind of easy to keep myself distracted. So like, you know, once adulthood came around and I'm like, you know, like I, like I have to confront this thing that's been eating at me on and off pretty much my entire life. Um, you know, I mean, I, I have to do something about this. And um, it was, you know, and, and it started out as like, I don't even know exactly what this is. I just know I have these feelings and I have to explore these feelings. And, um, you know, I have a, a really, really good friend who, um, she lives like three hours away from me, but, you know, we were talking once and she said, like, she used to run this like meetup group and mm-hmm. she said that, um, uh, a trans woman had come to this meetup group a couple of times and she said, you know, like, I'll be honest at first, like she made me kind of uncomfortable, but then I realized like, that's stupid. Like she's just a person. So like we had that conversation and so like that immediately identified her to me as someone that was safe to talk about this kind of stuff with. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so I just told her, I was like, Hey, like I, you know, I I have these feelings. I'm not sure exactly what it means, but it's something that I need to figure out. And she goes, well, like, how can I, how can I support you? Like, what do you need from me? So, you know, eventually we, we set up kind of a, a date and, um, you know, she did, um, she did a, you know, a makeover and we went clothes shopping and, you know, makeup and all that sort of stuff. And, um, I, you know, I went and I looked at the mirror for the first time and like, as like silly and new agey as this sounds, like, I really just felt like I was looking at me for the first time ever. Um, wow. That's pretty and fucking badass. <laughs> it was a, a fucking powerful feeling. And, and that was kind of when I knew I was like, well, this, this, this isn't a fucking joke. This is who I am. Um, so, you know, then, then I got really scared because I'm like, well, what is this, what is this going to mean for my life? You know, I used to have a job that was our, all our clients were super conservative. I wasn't in construction, but we were on construction sites all the time. And like, there's no way in hell any of this is going to go over well with them. (laughs) Um, 
<laughs> and 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 eventually I did. I, I I wasn't outright fired, but I had to quit to to be able to transition at work. And you know, so you know, it, I mean, it, it definitely hasn't been all all roses and sunshine because I loved that job and I didn't want to leave, but I had to. So, um, so yeah, so you know, that's that's kind of the you know the the personal the personal side of things. And, you know, now I'm, I'm part of this amazing community and I've been, you know, welcomed with open arms by people that like, you know, I've only known for a few months, but I consider to be super, super close friends. Um, you know, just, I mean, just amazing human beings that I've met both in the, you know, LGBT community here locally and in the atheist community and the, the podcasting community. Like I'm, I'm just absolutely blown away by all of the amazing people that I've gotten to know and, you know, how, and how great they've been to me. So, you know, I don't really have, I mean, I could complain about a lot if you wanted me to, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been a pretty amazing thing so far. Wow. <laughs> Man, I'm there. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. One thing I'm curious about is what was it like before you transitioned growing up not feeling like you fit your body? Mm. So the best way that I've found to describe this is, and, and that's, that's a great question, honestly. Um, the best way that I've found to describe it is there, there's a poem and the name of it escapes me. But um, the, the poet's name is Ali and you can find it on YouTube, O-L-I. And it's, it's, and it's, a, it's a trans thing. So... If you search for it, you can probably find it. But in their poem, they were talking about dysphoria and what physical dysphoria feels like. And to define the word dysphoria, that's basically, you know, when your your the neural map of your brain, like what your brain expects your body to be is not what your body actually is. And the the dissonance that's created when those two things don't match up. And that's what dysphoria is. So uh, maybe, in the maybe poem, I'm sorry, kind of like phantom limb syndrome for some people. Uh, actually, tra- uh, actually, trans people experience phantom limb syndrome very often. Wow. Um, trans men uh, mm-hmm. experience phantom limb syndrome with a phantom penis. Um, I've had it with phantom breasts. Um, yeah, it, in yeah, right. so so that's totally a thing. You 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 called that right. <laughs> hey. Um, so the best way that I can describe it to someone who hasn't felt it is so imagine what it would be like. And this is kind of funny, but like, think about it for a second. If you woke up tomorrow and had a penis attached to your elbow, (laughs) like just think about how fucking awkward that would feel. And how, (laughs) right. (laughs) Um, but like, you know, and and that's, that's a, a funny way to put it, but like, think about it for a second. Like how, unbelievably awkward and wrong that would feel and how terrified you would be for anyone to see you that way. Um, you know, so on and so forth. And like, that's really the best way that I've heard, you know, in a, in a short, like couple of sentences to describe that. And, um, you know, I mean, and that has implications, you know, for, for lots of things. I mean, I went through most of my twenties without having, any super satisfying sexual experiences because of it. Um, you know, it colored my relationships with the people that I was in. And a lot of times in ways that I wasn't aware of that, like I can only, I can only say like, Oh God, that, that probably happened because of that. Like I wasn't aware of it at the time that that's what was happening. But looking back on it now, you know, I was, I was playing a role that didn't fit me. And that's why, that's why things were awkward. And that's why things were weird. Man, that's horrible. I mean, your early mid twenties are your like fun, get out there and have weird sex time. Right. So I'm doing that in my early thirties. So. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, but yeah. So it's it it's a really weird thing. But you know, on the the, the you know the 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 other side of that is you know to finally have those things to start 
to come in alignment as they have over the past year or so that I've been taking hormones. I haven't had any surgeries yet, but, um, you know, I've been on hormones for uh, like a year and three or four months at this point. Um, and to like finally start to feel those things come into alignment. Um, it's like, it, it almost feels like I've been living like with a fog like are surrounding me my entire life. And that just went away. Um, you know, I always, you know, I never, I never f- experienced emotions in the way that really felt right. Like when I was, when I was angry, you know, I, I always felt like I should be a different kind of angry or when I was sad, I always felt like I should be a different kind of sad. And, um, you, and, and, and all of those things match up now. So basically and, testosterone didn't fit with how you thought things should be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, just it the the best way that I can well, like I said, the best way that I can really describe it is that I was just kind of living with a fog surrounding me and that's gone now. Um I can and, I can relate a little bit with looking back on uh some of my memories from when I was religious, members memories that had a, a spiritual significance. Yeah. It all feels like it was in a fog. Mm -hmm. That wasn't really me. Exactly. Because you weren't living life as the person that you knew you really were. There was a part of you that knew it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. There's that. I mean, that's probably more of a, you know, there's probably more parallels there than you realize. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Cognitive dissonance is just at a a deeper level. Right. Exactly. And, you know, now I have the kinds of relationships, like I relate to people in a way that, that actually feels right now. And, you know, when I react to things, it feels like, yeah, which, you know, all joking aside, sometimes it sucks because girl emotions sucks sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) Like, you know, and you know, random crying fits or like super hardcore cravings for ice cream and shit like that. Like that stuff's all hormone based. So like, really? I get that oh. shit normally. What the fuck? <laughs> don't, uh, don't ever take estrogen then my friend. I <laughs> 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 like, the, like so, baby, I thought they were candy. What the fuck? They're in a little <laughs> round package. Right. Come on. <laughs> And they are this, they are this pleasant, like light shade of blue. The pills are so like, I don't know, maybe <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard uh, stories about the, uh, the effects of, of uh, taking testosterone for trans men, mm-hmm. uh, just being like almost a completely brand new personality. Uh, I've heard it, heard it described kind of like, um, would you, s- does it feel like that at all for you going the other direction? I mean, maybe a little bit, but it's not, I I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's probably different for me as the person experiencing it versus, you know, people who have watched me go through this transition and, you know, who weren't kind of inside my head because kind of the way that I describe it is I used to have to work really, really hard to be the person that I wanted to be to, you know, you know, be compassionate, be nice, be patient, you know, all those kind of things. Like those things used to take a monumental effort for me and now they kind of don't. Um, hmm. so I'm not sure that people, you know, aside from me being generally happier and, you know, more, more confident and at least in certain ways and more sure of myself and who I am. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that, people have seen so much of a change in me outside of those things. Just because like I said, I was always kind of good at putting up that front, even though it wasn't necessarily the way that I felt. Um, and you know, and, and that's you know, the, the thing that's kind of hard to talk about, you know, when it comes to, you know, what it's like to transition, because I mean, you can talk to 10 different people and you will literally get 10 different stories. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I mean, there are lots of things that we share that, that are in common, of course, but well, here's a question. Yeah. Uh, early, you, you were talking about some of your friends were concerned about staying uh, friends uh, if your personality changed. Um, have are you still friends with all of them? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Well, then so. <laughs> I'm gonna guess that either a your your uh, personality didn't change outwardly that much, or b you changed for the better. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's probably a little so bit maybe, of both. Maybe he used to be a little bit of an asshole. I don't know. <laughs> well, see, I, <laughs> I always used to get made fun of as the one that was being like, I was always the sensitive friend. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> there, there was the running joke and, like, you know, the band that I was in, um, those guys are all still most of my close friends. Mm -hmm. and (laughs) there was this running joke because we played it like we went to this festival it was a huge festival we had an amazing reaction sold a ton of merch met a lot of really cool people and it was just i mean it was like the kind of show most people in bands ever dream of playing and never get to Mm -hmm. and you know like we were all hanging out afterwards and of course i was the one crying oh my god i'm so happy that i'm in this band i love you guys so much and everybody (laughs) was just making fun of me so it was like this you know kind of running joke when i came out like well shit that makes sense <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> so yeah so i mean i was always kind of the i was always kind of seen as being the overly sensitive person anyways and i mean I, it's it's even worse now i'm i'm so unbelievably sensitive it's uh, like sometimes i wish i i was less but yeah you know, i don't know it's who i am i own it cool yeah, yeah fucking rock that shit so, yeah, I wear I wear really good makeup so it doesn't run when I cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, right. got a tip on a brand? Oh God, you had to ask me that. My purse is upstairs. I don't I don't know. Uh, off the top of my head. <laughs> all right, you have to leave a comment then, so I know that you yeah. And scroll through the pictures. There's a couple. Oh God, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I made a few people cringe and cry. It was awesome <laughs> well see when it comes to like like gross body stuff like i yeah. mean i cringe a little bit but that stuff doesn't bother me so much it's yeah. the like touchy-feely emotional stuff that gets to me like yeah, fair enough all of those all of those super cute internet videos that everyone shares i cry at every single one of them mm. <laughs> i have to start posting picture uh, uh videos of my cat because wally's the best <laughs> well one story that i tell a lot of times and um like the first time anything like that ever happened to me so like i was having a really really bad week and this was like you know so like when i when i first came out it was like everybody was so awesome i was like shit like i i, I posted this letter on facebook and the the letter was Hey, this is a thing that's going to happen at some undetermined future date. I really don't know when, but I wanted everyone to know. Mm -hmm. And I got so much support. I was like, shit, well, I'm just going to do it now. (laughs) So, um, so I did. And I mean, it was like two or three days after that, that I was like, cool, I'm going to be Cali full time now outside of work, of course. Um, and I totally underestimated what kind of pressure it would put me under to be two different people in a day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That'd be crazy. Um, yeah. So, you know, and, and that was, you know, I mean, all the darkest places that I ever went with depression and wanting to die and stuff like that. I mean, it was all related to that. And <laughs> so, and, and I'd, I'd had a particularly bad week and I was, I was going through Facebook and somebody posted this fucking story. I don't know if either of you have read it, but it's like the one last Calvin and Hobbes story. Oh, fuck. Yeah. With the and, blank, blank panel at the end. Yeah. yeah. Oh no 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 no. This is um. It, it it's actually it's not um. It's not. Maybe it is. But it's it's the one where um. They're, where they're sledding Cal- out out in the. Oh no no. This one's like because I don't think this was an official one, okay. but it's it's you know Calvin is an old a super old man and he's like on his deathbed, and um you know his you know daughter or somebody goes out to get the rest of because they because he knows he's about to die. And God, I'm going to start crying now. And Hobbs shows up one last time and he hadn't seen Hobbs in forever. And there was this super emotional reunion or whatever. Um, Cause like he's going to give Hobbs to one of his kids and like something like that would have probably made me tear up anyways. But because I'd had such a terrible time at that point, like, I mean, I just totally opened up and I just lost my shit for like two hours and then and then after it was over with like i was laying in bed and i i like i'd kind of calmed down and i was like well like i'm i'm probably just going to go to bed now all of the sudden i was like holy shit i need ice cream right the fuck now <laughs> <laughs> so this is like midnight and like 
I literally have to get up out of bed, get dressed, and go to UDF to get some fucking ice cream, or I'm not going to be able to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I was talking to a friend of mine on Facebook, and she's like, fucking welcome to womanhood. What did you think you were signing up for? <laughs> uh, huh. My so, wife makes a little bit more sense now. Yeah, see, like, <laughs> well, and, you know, that's something that I, I tell people all the time is like, you know, all that stuff that you think's bullshit that your, that your girlfriend or wife says about like, you know, those like crazy random food cravings and mood swings and shit. Like, like it's all fucking true because none of that used to happen to me and it all does now. <laughs> huh. So that, I guess that really puts uh, some of the bullshit statements people make on gender like it doesn't matter or it's all the same clearly to bed having been on both sides well yeah and you know i'm I'm definitely not a scientist you know i'm not going to pretend that i understand all of the science behind you know the the phenomenon of of being transgender or um, you know, the the dynamics of gender and whether it's a social construct or whether there's a biological element. Like, you know, I tend to think sure. that it's kind of a little bit of all of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, th- those things do matter. And I think the, the problem is that other people's gender matters to other people. You know what I mean? Like, the only person who should really care about my gender identity is me. Yeah. You know, the, the problem comes when other people have a problem with it and, you know, don't think that it's okay. Like, you know, because I was born with a penis, but I identify as a woman, like that's somehow a problem. And, you know, it, you know, frankly, like you're not in my head. You don't know me better than I do. Like you can either accept this and understand that this is, you know, this is who I am or, you know, and you know, there, I mean, there are lots of great arguments for, you know, the idea that, that gender is a, is totally a social construct and that it's all bullshit and that we should like leave gender behind completely. And, you know, I, 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 I wish I could be there, you know, just kind of like I, like I wish everyone in the world was pansexual. Like I wish people could just be attracted to each other regardless of what their gender is. Um, but you know, that's not the world we live in. That's not the culture that I grew up in or the world that I live in. So, you know, this is who I am and, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that I would change it if I could, you know, because at this point in my life, I like who I am. You know, there's, there's lots of, I mean, there's lots of stuff that I don't like and, you know, sometimes I get afraid that I think a little too highly of myself or that I'm too aggressive when I debate with people. Like there's little things like that, but like as a person, I'm happy with me. So like, I'm not super interested in other people's opinion of it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. No, totally. Yeah. I mean, you you got to be happy with yourself. Uh, fuck everybody else, what they think about you, as long as you're happy. Yeah. Well, yeah. And my 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 one uncle that I'm cool with, I was talking to him on the phone once, because um, there was a lot of kind of like family drama, other sorts of family drama that was going down, like right at this time. Like, I feel like such an asshole. I came out to my mom as trans, and then two weeks later, she lost her house. So like, there's just like there was a lot of drama or whatever going on there. But I was talking to my uncle on the phone. And, and and my uncle's totally cool, but it, like he used to call me little brother, and 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 I was talking to him, and he goes, he goes, little brother. At the end of the day, only person that's got to live with you is you. If you're happy, fuck anybody else. And I was like, okay, <laughs> yeah, that's that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, it's like <laughs> good advice. You know what I mean? You can you can boil hours and hours of conversations down to that. Um, I mean, I wish it was that easy. Obviously, like other people's opinion of me has a real effect on me. I lost my fucking job over it. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. assholes are still assholes. Mm-hmm. Well, right. But, right. You know, and that's keeping it to a fortune cookie cutter. You know, <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. If you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one time donations or to support us on a per episode monthly or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please think of the kittens. It's it's a journey, you know. I'm definitely definitely not where I want to be, but I'm I'm headed there, and you know, I I think if I could, 
if if I could sum up, you know, my story, it would be like trans people honestly like our needs aren't that complicated. Like some of these things are difficult, but it's not really super complicated. Like we need the same things that everyone else does, you know, social support, emotional support, healthcare, safety, security, affirmation, you know, all of those, like these are basic human needs that everyone has. Sounds about kind of like what I need. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. um, and even the healthcare part, isn't that different than what a lot of people get. Oh yeah. Hormones, for example, is something a lot of people who've been through cancer or various surgeries Mm -hmm. get provided to them. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and I mean, and, and healthcare is a big one. I mean, I happen to have a job where I made enough money to pay for hormones and to pay for my therapist and to pay for my endocrinologist and all that sort of, sort of stuff out of pocket. Um, because I didn't have, I mean, I have insurance now, but I didn't at the time and it was like 75 bucks every other week to my therapist, 70 bucks a month for hormones, $65 for an endocrinologist visit. Like that shit adds up. Mm-hmm. And I I was I was fortunate enough that like I had a job where I made enough money to pay for all that stuff. Um barely, but I did and and you know not everyone's there and and that's that, that's assuming that you can find a doctor to do it. Um I mean I can think of in in Cincinnati which is a gigantic city, I can think of four healthcare providers that are actually trans competent and like actually really know what they're doing with trans people like Oh, a story a story that I hear so often is people will go into their primary care physician and they'll say like, well, I'm trans, I'm going to start transitioning, whatever. And, you know, sometimes the reaction's negative. Sometimes the reaction's positive. But even if the reaction's positive, you hear stuff like, well, I've never had a trans patient before. I don't even really know what all this entails. And I'm, I'm betting that's hurt a <laughs> lot in mm-hmm. the best case scenario. <laughs> well, right. Exactly. Um, and so that'd you know, be that, the good doctors right, admitting exactly. ignorance. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, and, and I was lucky enough, like I I lucked into finding the uh, a therapist who happens to refer to the best endocrinologist in Cincinnati who only takes referrals from like two different therapists. You can't even walk into this guy's office and say, I want to be a new patient. He doesn't take new patients. He only takes referrals. Oh, wow. <laughs> so like, yeah, so like the barrier to entry for these things is really high. And I sort of lucked into it, honestly. Um, and, and there are some places where there's literally no one. I mean, something that the, there's a big debate in the trans community over is self-medication. Um, there are websites where you can go and you can buy these hormones to take yourself without, without medical supervision. Yeah, that doesn't and sound very safe. It's not. It's not safe at all. Oh. But – Going without hormones is not safe either because people commit suicide when they don't have access to that thing. So yeah. in that, in, you know, in that scenario, it's about harm reduction. Which option is worse? You know, do I prevent this person from committing suicide by letting them do this shaky medical thing that they don't have access to unless they do it in this shady way? Um, oh, you know, and wow. I mean, that's, that's a, that's, that's a tough question and I've never personally been put in that position. So I'm not going to come down and judge people and say like, you know, well, if you do this, it's dangerous. You're stupid. It's just more like, well, here's what the risks are. If you choose to do it, like, you know, I hope you're okay, <laughs> you know, cause and, some people, they don't have another choice. And hopefully doing low enough doses to not risk severe problems. Well, yeah. And, you know, I mean, and there's kind of a standard dose that almost everyone takes. But, you know, if if there's anything about your metabolism or, you know, where your hormone levels are naturally, um, you know, those things get off balance. You know, I mean, I've heard of people who self-medicate and then it actually ends up slowing their transition down because they didn't have someone monitoring their levels Mm -hmm. and it just like completely messed things up. Now, you know, does it happen that way often? No, but. I mean, it's, it's enough to be worried about. So, you know, I mean, if, if, I mean, that's just one little thing that demonstrates the huge need for trans competent healthcare. And, you know, there are some places where it's great, you know, and generally in big cities, you can find a couple, um, you know, and then that's, you know, assuming that you're lucky enough to have insurance to pay for it or, you know, have a job where you can pay for it out of pocket. Um, but, you know, I mean, just super basic stuff. And then, and then there's, you know, there's, discrimination still i have a friend who 
went to the emergency room because she thought she was having heart problems. And instead of treating her, the doctor came in, preached to her for about 10 minutes about how she was never going to be a real woman because she had a penis and then left. Oh, motherfucker. Mm. Um, and, and, and I mean, I could go on and on. I mean, uh, there's a story of a, a, a trans girl got into a car accident. And um, I, I don't remember if her if her clothes were on fire or something like that but the first responders had to take her clothes off as part of like treating her and when they got her clothes off and saw that she had a penis they stopped and were like making jokes and high-fiving each other and like laughing about it wait and oh yeah and when she eventually got to the hospital the doctor said like yeah i missed my chance to save her by like 10 minutes oh and I mean, trans people die of cancer, like trans, trans men die of cancer, of, of breast cancer because they they can't find doctors to treat them. Um, no. you know, there's, there's all, I mean, I, I could go on and on and on about those kinds of stories. Well, so that's, sorry, that's, go ahead. That one's bullshit because breast cancer in men is a real problem. I was going to say it happens to everybody, <laughs> you know, it may not be as common as breast cancer in women, but it is a thing. Well, right. And well, and by by trans men, I mean um, you know people who were assigned female at birth but transitioned right. to, to male. So they, I mean they they have the the body chemistry that makes them as susceptible as as cis women. But whether uh, you, you whether you you look at the person as a a woman, breast cancer is a real risk, or as a man, right, exactly, breast cancer exactly. is a real risk. And you just got a patient with cancer, right? What the fuck? <laughs> and there was there was another story about um uh, a, a trans woman she broke her arm playing in an LGBT softball league okay. and because it was an LGBT software softball league um her insurance wouldn't cover the cost of her broken arm because it was an LGBT software league they were able to manipulate it around to be like well that was part of her transition so we're not going to cover it because, oh, by the way, <laughs> there are lots of insurance companies who cover absolutely nothing when it comes to transition. Um, it's it's still legal to have blanket exemptions for transition-related stuff in insurance coverage. Mm. So even people who have good jobs with good insurance may still have to pay for that kind of stuff out of pocket. Wow. So, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. We covered a story a while back. I, I don't remember which group it was exactly, but was... Um, wanting to, they were looking at declassifying, was it gender identity disorder as a mental health, um, yeah. disorder, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which got both cheers and jeers for what that would mean for the trans community. Well, right. It's a double edged sword because, you know, what, what my endocrinologist likes to say is that, you know, being trans is not a mental condition. It's a physical condition. So, you know, it, I mean, it is a condition that requires treatment for people, but it's not a mental illness. You know, those are, those are two different things. So, you know, I think removing, uh, you know, gender identity disorder from the DSM was a, was a good thing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not a condition, a, a legit condition that needs legit medical treatment. You know, obviously not everybody who is n- not everyone who has gender issues or, you know, doesn't fully identify with their own gender. Not everyone pursues physical transition. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I don't want to be like, you know, all trans people do this because that's not true. But, you know, for people that feel the need to do it, you know, those medical needs are as legitimate as any other medical need of, you know, a fucking appendicitis or, you know, anything like that. Like it's it's no more or less legitimate than that. It's a it's a physical condition that for people who need it, need treatment for it. And, you know, it should be at least as covered as other things. Like I'm not saying all trans people deserve free. I mean, we can make, you know, I mean, we could totally have the universal healthcare argument, but like at the very least, it needs to be looked at as treatment for any other condition that anyone would ever have for people who need it. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, you know, I mean, that's just not the case. You know, some people are, some people are fortunate enough to have it. Some people are are unfortunate enough not to, um, you know, Lucky for me, I was on the winning side of that, but I know a lot of people who aren't. Well, and I think it's kind of damaging that so many mental health issues are considered not medical, that they're considered mental health when there's a lot where it is something physical. 
Right. Well, and there's part of me that, and I mean, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I might be completely full of shit, but there's part of me (laughs) that doesn't even really understand why there needs to be a distinction. Yeah. Like there should just be illness, like whether it's mental, I mean, you know, you have, you have, you know, special specialists for cancer or specialists for ALS or specialists for whatever, why not just, you know, a mental health professional, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, whatever, like they're just another type of healthcare professional. Mm-hmm. A psychiatrist um, is just someone who tweaks brain chemistry. Exactly. And, and, and I think, I honestly, I think that would go a very long way to destigmatizing mental illness. Um, you know, because mental illness has a very undeserved stigma. Um, you know, if, you know, if you have depression, if you have anxiety, if you're schizophrenic, you know, all of those things, like people look at those as like personality defects, you know, like, oh yeah, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, there's something wrong with me in the way that there's something wrong with someone who has cancer. You know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> it's not something that, you know, and, and this is talking strictly about mental illness, obviously not being trans. Like there's nothing wrong with being trans. Um, <sighs> But um, Kelly said it. There's something wrong with being trans. I'm the transphobic uh, trans activist. <laughs> <laughs> Both diabetes and depression can cause people to miss work. Uh, it can right. cause people relationship problems, uh, difficulty living a normal, happy, healthy, energetic life. And both require or at least often require medication. Right. That doesn't so, really sound all that different to me. Exactly. The symptoms might be a little bit different, but. Well, yeah. And, you know, just like anything else, some people experience it mildly and only need mild treatment. Some people experience it and it's debilitating. And you know what I mean? Like there's, there's a whole, there's a whole spectrum there. Um, but you know, I don't know. Like I said, I'm not a doctor. That could all be total bullshit. There could be a totally legit reason to, to separate the two out, but just, you know, that's something that I've thought about a lot. Um, because, you know, I mean, I don't have any diagnosed mental illnesses, you know, I mean, I'm, I've never been diagnosed with depression or anxiety or anything like that. I definitely have experienced those things, but I don't know if like they're worthy of a medical diagnosis, whatever, like, but, um, the diagnostic materials aren't fun. (laughs) I, I I don't really know anything about it. I mean aside from like there was one time when I was like I was in a really really bad bad place and I was like, F- like I'm gonna look up the fucking diagnostic criteria for depression to see if I fit okay. and well and of course that's like that's like fucking looking at WebMD and convincing yourself that you have this rare disease that no one's had in 200 years mm-hmm. because you're not a doctor and you're not supposed to have access to that information because you don't know what the fuck you're doing with it um, but I mean, you know, that's where I was. <laughs> so, and I was like, yeah, like I totally fit all this in my, in my own completely unqualified opinion. <laughs> um, but you know, there is, there is a, a, a far outsized, uh, you know, instance of, you know, mental health issues in the, in the trans community. And, you know, it's not because being trans is a bad thing. It's because our society treats trans people like shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like, um, I have, I have a friend who, who does a lot of this work. Like he's, uh, he's, he's one, he's a nurse in his day job, but you know, he's also a social worker and he does work with these trans organizations and he has, you know, lots and lots of clients and, and he's like, it's amazing how people come into this situation and they have all these horrible issues with depression and anxiety and all of these things. And it is absolutely incredible to watch those things disappear once these people get the transition support they need and mm-hmm. the emotional support that they need. I mean, those things, I mean, they just disappear. Well, even if society was totally cool and everybody was welcoming, accepting and helpful, Having your brain, body, and hormones not line up would be a shitty experience regardless. Absolutely. But, you know, it wouldn't take people forever to get treatment for it either. Yeah. You know, so I... It'd be a lot faster and easier. And, you know, maybe when I had this revelation about myself when I was fucking 10 years old, I could have actually felt comfortable going to my mom and saying, hey, like, I feel like this is a thing. And that's not a knock on my mom. Believe me, like, my mom is amazing. And, you know, my mom spent my entire childhood telling me, like, you know, 
who you are is okay, whoever that turns out to be. And, you know, you can talk to me about anything. Like, I mean, those hangups were totally on me, you know, and I'd never heard of a trans person before. I didn't know what that word, I didn't know that that word existed. I didn't know that there were other people who felt like me, you know? So like if all of that stigma didn't exist, you know, maybe I would have felt comfortable going to my mom and saying, and you know, and I mean, you can, you can, what if Mm -hmm. all day long, Man, that kind of sounds like uh, me and my childhood, you know, uh, Southern Baptist, you know, from a, I was questioning from a really young age and, you know, I, I, I didn't even know what an atheist was. I didn't know that they were, that that was a thing when I was, you know, 12, 13 years old, but you know, that I, I didn't, it was, I kind of found, found what I was, uh, through books and stuff. I don't know. Kind of, kind of rambling. Sorry. Uh, No, 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 you're fine. No, I mean, that's, I mean, well, and that's, that's kind of the whole point. You know, when I talk about the intersection of, you know, atheist and LGBT activism, like, I mean, it's, it's in, in a lot of ways, it's the same kind of journey. Like you didn't know that people who felt like you existed. So you immediately felt like you were wrong and that there was something wrong with you when, you know, in reality, it was this bullshit thing that you were indoctrinated into was actually wrong. And yeah, it took didn't you. Know that, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that I was the only one, you know, mm-hmm. I didn't know that there was, you know, a whole community out there. So many resources. If, if you're lucky enough to be around them. Yeah. Right. And how powerful of an experience was that when you found that, when oh. you realize like, like not only are there other people like me, but there's a fucking community. Yeah. Great for internet. <laughs> right. <laughs> And, well, and, you know, and I mean, that happened for me the first time I went to a pride festival. Um, oh I, I used to work for a nonprofit um, plug. They're called a voice for the innocent. Um, and mm. basically it's a peer support community for those affected by rape and sex abuse. And the first year that we went, I was in the closet still. I had, I had come out to three people at that point. Um, So I was, you know, my, I spent my first pride festival in the closet, which is a funny thing to say. Um, but that was the first time I was like, oh my God, because pride in Cincinnati is a big fucking deal. Like 50,000 people attend pride in Cincinnati. Not bad. We should get you out to a Seattle pride, but not bad. Oh, oh, I'm sure. (laughs) Um, (laughs) but like, you know, that was like, you know, not only are there other people like me, but there's actually a community here for me to be a part of. And, you know, there are other people who are going through the same stuff that I am, not some random people on the internet, but like people in my city, people that I can get to know and I can become friends with. And I mean, that was such a hugely powerful thing for me. And that's, I mean, that's why, you know, pride itself, like that's why pride means so much to me because that was the first time I realized like, holy shit. And, and it was actually that night, um, you know, because you know, the, the nonprofit thing kind of started not too long after the band broke up and it's, hmm. you know, it was with, um, you know, one of my, my friend, Jamie, who started a voice for the innocent, he was the other guitar player in that band. So, um, but I was really close with all the people that were on the board at that time. And like, and I was feeling so good after pride. Like I chose that night to come out to everybody else that was involved with the voice for the innocent. Um, you know, we had, a we had like this group Facebook message thing going on talking about business or whatever. Um, and I was like, yeah, so, you know, in the spirit of all of this, like, I'm, I'm going to let you all know right now that this is a thing and, um, and everybody was great. So it's like, you know, pride was a huge deal for me because of that. And obviously the internet. Awesome. Just having that, that community there, like just ready to step in and like, you know, give you a fucking hug. Just, I'm sure that could, couldn't do anything, but you know, help a fuckload. Oh, I mean, it's, it's incredible. And I mean, I had that experience. The first atheist convention I ever went to was reason con mm. in North Carolina. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's what it was like there for me. You know, I always, I always worry when I go to things like that, like, am I going to be the token trans person there? And is that like, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be the trans person. I'm not going to be that friend that everyone's hanging out with. Like I'm going to be the token trans person. And, um, and you know, that's, that's not how it was at all. I mean, obviously those conversations came up because that's what I do. And, you know, I would meet people that I didn't know before and tell them about the podcast and tell them my story and stuff. But like, I was just, I was just hanging out with friends and, um, and that was an incredibly, incredibly powerful experience. Like just being able to just like, you know, I'm not, I'm not trans activist Callie, right? Like 
I'm just your friend Callie. <laughs> you know, like, and uh, and that's that's a pretty valuable thing too. Yeah. Okay. No. Nice. Well, and you aren't the first oh. trans person to be on our show, but who was so, uh, Stephanie Gatormson? Oh, I love her. Yeah, we've also had uh, Danielle Moscato on. Yes, I've had her on my show too. But you would, I would say, you're the token trans person on our show. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's been the main focus of of the, of the discussion. Yeah. Well, no, and that's, and that's okay. Totally and, yeah. true. And when I and and when I say that, I don't mean to be like like oh my god, everyone wants to talk about being being trans, and that's not what I want to talk. Like that's totally not the thing. Like I've obviously made that my uh, I've made that my thing. Like the niche that I'm trying to fill in the atheist community is that niche. You know what I mean? Like I, I want to be the person that's talking about those things. So like, you know, don't take that as um like, God, I wish somebody would talk to me about star Trek, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's not about that, but it's, you know, I like to be able to turn that off every once in a while and just hang out around friends. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, I, I haven't seen anybody that's like, you know, oh, we're just hanging around and having fun. Hey, you want to talk about your penis for a minute? Like, <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> like yeah, never well, experienced anything like that, thankfully. It's like atheist um, <laughs> meetings. After like the first half hour, nobody talks about religion. Right, right. Because you're just you're just hanging out with friends. Like, you know, you have this thing in common. So, like, you're obviously going to talk about that for a minute. But like after that, we're just, you know, we're just hanging out. Um, so so that's valuable to me, too. And, you know, like I said, I mean, obviously, like. I put myself out there to have these conversations. So that's something that I want to do. And it's something that I enjoy doing. Um, I just, I like being able to set it down too. Very nice. I think we are running out of time. Well, oh. this has been fun. So it's, it's amazing <laughs> how that happens. You talk and for a while and then all of a sudden now uh, the time is gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad, I'm glad I had that effect. I'll, yeah. I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and take full credit for that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So, Callie, what do you have to plug? So, um, obviously, my show, The Gaytheist Manifesto. You can find us on iTunes and Spreaker, Facebook.com slash The Gaytheist Manifesto. I am at Gaytheist Callie on Twitter. You can find me on Facebook. I'll add pretty much anyone, which is a decision that I usually end up regretting at some point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm Callie Wright, C-A-L-L-I-E-W-R-I-G-H-T. Just don't be a random person asking me for sex. If if you have any listeners that are into that kind of thing, don't 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 do that thing to me. But whoa, <laughs> that happens. Hey, I'm, just, I'm I'm just oh oh yes. <laughs> You've never been a woman on the internet, hun. <laughs> 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 I have I have gotten random dick pics from lots of different people, and nice. um oh yeah, like and <laughs> and. Yeah, like I had somebody get super creepy and send me a back a picture of myself that was on my Facebook and was like, "Do you want to kiss me? I like to fuck the body." <laughs> and like, really? I'm, I'm I'm not joking. That's literally what he typed. <laughs> that, um, that's I I actually kind of like English, so <laughs> right. I think I think this guy was I think this guy was from Pakistan. Nice, uh, wow. Okay, yeah, so we, we could we could make a whole show about uh, Muslims that you know are yeah very homophobic, and then you get messages like that. Right. Yeah. Exactly. At, at least out in public, you know. And I'm sorry, but uh, when you were talking about uh, you know talking about your penis, I I totally heard Mrs. Garrison and you. <laughs> just, just yeah. <laughs> we both love scissoring so <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> all right well callie thank you very much for joining us thank you guys for having me this has been a lot of fun definitely <laughs> and uh, if you if you need any help getting any people on which i kind of doubt that you seems like you got a pretty good thing going you know? but if <laughs> thank you. if past guests of ours you know put a good word in for you and you know do the same for us maybe sometime yeah oh yeah absolutely yeah, if so, it, yeah. let me know i i, I usually I, I tend to keep uh I, I tend to try and keep relationships going with people that i've had on the show so so yeah you know nice um i haven't had uh i haven't had a ton of like super super famous people on the show um 
I lucked out and got Matt, Seth, and Aaron on on an episode, but that's because Pretty I know cool. Adam. That's because I know Adam Reeks, and he was shuttling them around Australia <laughs> when they were. And uh, yeah, so he woke me up at like four o'clock in the morning, like, "Hey, do you want to interview these guys on your uh, show?" And I was like, "I'm running on like two hours of sleep. I'm super delirious, but of fucking course, I'm not going to say no to that." So yeah, yeah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, and for our listeners, we'll be back at you next week with news. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.